So it's not it's it's not what I tell you to eat that's important. It's what I tell you not, not to, to eat. eat. Okay, what are the four? That's or five? rule number one. <clears throat> so the okay. first thing is don't eat grains. Period. No grains. No grains. Zero grains. Zero grains. And that includes rice. That includes corn. I just gave a paper at the American Heart Association three weeks ago at the Lifestyle and Epidemiology Annual Meeting, where we looked at people with leaky gut. Mm -hmm. And they had already been on a gluten-free diet. So that means they were avoiding wheat, rye, and barley. And they still had leaky gut. They were eating rice if not gluten? or right? Yeah, rice doesn't have gluten. Uh, <coughs> quinoa doesn't have gluten. Okay. Buckwheat doesn't have gluten. Corn doesn't have gluten. But we test these people, 70% of people who react to gluten will react to corn as if it was mm, gluten. Wow. And I see so many people uh, who are eating gluten-free who still have autoimmune disease and or leaky gut. So when in this paper we took away not only their gluten, but all lectins, major lectins, and that includes the nightshade family, unfortunately, uh, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, uh, kind of the Tom Brady diet, to use another football example. He eats very similar to my program. Uh, take away peanuts and cashews, which are beans, and have people, if they're going to eat beans, pressure cook their beans. Uh, pressure cooking will destroy all lectins except gluten. And then we take away certain milk products, so American cow milk <clears throat> products, and we showed in this paper that not only will they heal their leaky gut, uh, which just by removing those things, but in nine out of 10 people that we've now retested multiple occasions, they no longer react to gluten with, mm. by their immune system. Now, I'm not saying that Guess what? If you follow my protocol, then you can have all the bread and yeah, yeah. Milk that you want. No. Uh, but it is intriguing that you can re-educate the immune system to defend itself to, against these to things. not get interested anymore mm -hmm. because the gut is sealed. So you could have it once in a while and it shouldn't affect it or penetrate through. Correct. But if you keep doing it every day, every meal, the, then it's going to penetrate It's going to be the through. same thing. So zero grains, no rice, no corn until you heal the gut, then maybe every once in a while. Yeah, and then what we do is we actually ask people, okay, let's, you know, let's reintroduce something. Yeah, and see, see how you feel. Yeah. Um, and, don't get and, too comfortable though. Yeah, don't get too comfortable. <laughs> and what we do in really bad autoimmune folks is that we will, you know, we're every three to six months, we're retesting their leaky gut uh -huh. and their autoimmune status and, um, it's, I mean, it's really kind of humorous. Sometimes we see that when people reintroduce things, they, uh, their leaky gut starts again. I, I'll give you a great example, personal example. So years ago, uh, when we first started doing autoimmune testing, uh, we obviously do it on ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I did it on myself and my staff comes running in. So, oh my gosh, you know, Dr. Gundry, you have lupus. I said, I don't have lupus. <laughs> Come on, you know, where's the lupus? And they said, no, 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 you know, you're positive for anti-nuclear antibody, which is one of the good markers for lupus, uh, an autoimmune condition. And I'm going, well, you know, that's interesting. Uh, my family, my father's side of the family has massive psoriasis. My dad was on methotrexate mm -hmm. for 15. 51 years. Was it like a steroid or like a cream? Yeah, it's, an, it's a, one of the immunosuppressants. Wow. Um, yeah, he was on an immuno, an immunosuppressant. So you wouldn't have psoriasis all over? Yeah, so yeah, oh, you would have psoriasis everywhere, everywhere. Wow. And uh, so I said, and my aunt had it, and my cousins had it. So I'm going, you know, that makes sense. I obviously have a predisposition to an autoimmune disease. And I, I said, oh, I think I'll turn it off because I'm always experimenting with food. That's my job. And so I ate perfectly. I followed the rules for two weeks, remeasured my anti-nuclear antibody, done, gone, huh. turned off. After how many weeks? Two weeks. Wow. I said, yeah, that's pretty interesting. So we actually did a study that we presented at the American Heart 
two years ago, of 102 patients with biomarker proven autoimmune disease, like anti-nuclear antibody, like rheumatoid arthritis, like Hashimoto's, so Kelly Clarkson, just to give you an example, mm -hmm. and retested them at six months. And most of these people were on immunosuppressants, like what you see on TV every day, and we could- Drugs. Drugs. Yeah. And in six months' time, 95 out of the 102 people were negative for their marker of autoimmune disease, and they were off their drugs. Wow. 94% success rate. That's not bad. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> so, uh, so then, so two years ago, I was in New York City uh, working on actually the longevity paradox, and uh, I said, you know, I need to rechallenge myself. Let me, you know, things are going great. Mm -hmm. So I was there for about four days. I had pizza. Ice I had cream. bread. I had ice cream. I had pasta. I yeah. had tomatoes. Mm. Oh. It's good. And I felt fine. So I come running back uh, on a Monday to the office and I have them draw my blood. Boom, I'm positive for anti-nuclear antibody again. Wow. And I went, oh, shucks. And I said, well, this is interesting. I'm gonna turn it off. So I you know, ate normally for two weeks, retested, boom, turned off. Wow. So, uh, so when I when I give pr pronouncements on autoimmune disease, one colleague came up to me one time. She said, "What do you know about autoimmune disease?" I said, "How dare you talk about autoimmune disease?" Oh, really? Well, you know, I can make mine come and go, <laughs> <laughs> and that's the point. <clears throat> Yeah. You can you can stop these things, wow. and that, all it is is a man, manifestation of leaky gut. Wow. Okay. So, so, you, you, so three things you said so far of leaky gut. I'm hearing you say no rice or corn, which is zero grains, no nightshades, which are tomatoes. Does that mean like tomato sauce or if things are prepared a certain way? Yeah. So here's the deal: peel and deseed your tomatoes. Uh, peel and deseed your peppers. Um, the Southwest. The Southwest American Indians uh, always peel and de-seed their peppers before they eat them or grind them into chili. Uh, mm -hmm. They've known that from time immemorial. The mm -hmm. Italians always peel and de-seed their tomatoes before they make sauce. Um, and I, I get to interview chefs all, all over Italy, yeah. and they all say, you know, you gotta. We do this. Yeah, there. you yeah, gotta. Yeah. yeah, you gotta do this. And I said, Well, how do you know you gotta do this? Well, my mother. We just know. Yeah, yeah. yeah my mother taught me. Well, how did she know? Where my grandmother taught her. Yeah. They, they know. Now here's something that's interesting: peanuts and cashews. I'm a big fan of peanuts, and I think the last time you came on, maybe the first time you came on, you were like, you can't eat peanuts anymore, and I didn't eat them because I was having like little rashes every now and mm -hmm. then, and I was thinking it was probably like the almond butter, nut butter. Just I was consuming so much almond butter. Yeah and peanut butter. And so I really cut back and I was like, okay, no peanut butter for a while and cut back on almond butter and felt fine. About a couple months ago, I started eating a lot more peanut butter and noticed it started coming back. And so I shut it off again and it went away. Now, why is peanut butter an issue? Why is it such a big thing? So 94% of human beings are born with an antibody to the peanut lectin. And so now you go, so most of us inherit an antibody against the peanut lectin. And you go, well, wait a minute, when, when I was growing up and probably when you were growing up, very few people had peanut allergies. Mm -hmm. Now, no, it seems like everyone does. everybody's got Why peanut allergies. Well, because our immune system used to be taught by our gut microbiome that hey, you know, there's some nasty stuff out there, but we got your back and we're gonna handle it mm -hmm. long before you ever have to deal with it. And you just, you know, let's just, you know, use a Southern California example. There's a bunch of kids on the beach and they got a bonfire, not in the time of social distancing, right. but, and they're having a great time. And the cops uh, are, you know, looking at the beach saying, oh yeah, we know those kids are good kids. You know, they're not, they're not troublemakers. We'll go have a donut and a smoke and just chill. So compare that, that you're in a disadvantaged part of a community and there's gang members and there's shooting 
And the cops, everybody is a suspect until proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. And the cops approach you with, you know, an Uzi rather than an ice cream cone. And what's happened to us is that for the most part, our lines of defense against bad things like a peanut lectin are gone. Our gut is leaky so that our cops are always on hyper alert. Mm -hmm. So a little benign little peanut lectin comes in now. It breaks through. And the cops go, oh my gosh, you know, kill it, kill it. Right. And that's why we got EpiPens with all of our little kids. Wow. Now, the same thing happens. We, most of us, number one, don't have a great microbiome that is able to fend off viruses, fend off bacteria like they should. Mm. After all, they're defending their home. Right. But more importantly, probably, because most of us have leaky gut, most of our immune system that should be up in our nose, in our mouth, protecting us against a virus is down in our gut attacking whatever is coming through the wall of our gut. And it's completely distracted. Now, where I'm going with this is you hear on the news that people with chronic medical conditions are the people who are most susceptible to viruses in general, to the flu, to the coronavirus, mm -hmm. to whatever. And well, why is that? Why, why would having high blood pressure mm -hmm. make you susceptible, more susceptible to dying from a virus? That actually doesn't make any sense. But if having high blood pressure <clears throat> is actually a sign that you have a leaky gut, and that most of your immune system is actually down in your gut rather than patrolling the periphery like it should. And your immune system is, I mean, all the troops are down distracted. Then it makes completely sense mm -hmm. that you would be susceptible to yeah, this. Yeah. And let me give you a great story. Yeah. Years ago, <laughs> years ago, I was at the... Uh, I present a lot of papers at the uh, microbiota meeting in Paris every year. And there was a fascinating paper that um, there are smelling neurons, olfactory neurons, you know, th that live in our nose, that live in our kidneys and live in our heart. And you, and you go, well, why would I need, why would my kidneys need to smell anything? Why would my heart need to smell anything? And it actually intrigued me until I realized in writing my next book, which is called The Energy Paradox, that these smelling organs in our kidneys and our heart smell bacterial farts, the mm -hmm. fermentation products of bacteria. And they can smell good farts and they can smell bad farts. Mm -hmm. And if they smell bad bacteria farts, they actually activate the blood pressure system to make your blood vessels more rigid and mm. give you high blood pressure. Mm. And what was striking to me, and I didn't know the reason way back when, is when I had people with high blood pressure and we put them on my program, one of the first things, the first calls I would get is, uh, what are you giving me? What supplement am I taking that's making me lightheaded and dizzy? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I look at my nurse and I look at me, I'm going, oh, there isn't a supplement that does that. You know, come on into the office, let's see. And of course their blood pressure is really low. Mm -hmm. And we go, okay, you know, let's cut that high blood pressure pill in half. Uh, and then they call back a couple weeks later and say, I'm dizzy again. And we bring them back in, sure enough, their blood pressure is low. I go, okay, let's get rid of that blood pressure. What we were doing is we were changing the bacterial signals in huh. their gut, and they were now getting, if you will, good farts that they were smelling in their kidneys, and their blood vessels were reacting. And we eventually developed tests that we could prove that in fact that happens, and publish that data as well. So this is not 
It's not science fiction, it's not conjecture. Mm. And so we, we now know that there's this incredible symbiotic organism that is us. And the more we learn mm. about the really important part of us, the more it all makes sense on how we work. And returning to Dr. David <coughs> Kessler, the head of the FDA, he said, you know, when you and I, Steve, were going through medical school, we were taught that the intestines was just a hollow tube mm -hmm. and all they were there for was to absorb protein, fat, and carbohydrates, end of story. That's all we were taught. And he says, who, who could have guessed that you know, living down there were a hundred trillion five pounds of bugs that were essential mm -hmm. for the functioning of everything? Uh, you know, wow. it's like Dr. Amen says, you know, who would have guessed that mental illness is coming from the, the gut. gut? Wow. And the connected, the, the heart yeah, and the, no, the brain and the gut. Yeah, the gut-brain connection. Oh. He said, who would have guessed? Because all of us thought, that's just a tube. Yeah. And yeah, there's a few bacteria down there and they're really bad and we poop them out and, you know, it's just waste. Right. Now we know. To Let's think more than that. They are us. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> now, there's so many things you've covered here that I want to close a loop on a couple of these. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out the solution to my peanut butter problem. What's the nut butter that I can eat that's actually okay? So, uh, is there one? Yeah, so interestingly enough, we have a number of people with rheumatoid arthritis who react to the peel of an almond. Mm -hmm. There is a lectin in the peel of almonds. So you take the peel off. So you take the peel so off. The, and these so skinned the, almonds are okay. Yeah, so like Marcon almonds. And there are actually a couple of companies that now make peeled almond butter and you can find them really yeah it and shouldn't be an issue then it shouldn't be an issue yeah so um if you're going to choose that's interesting yeah so walnuts are a great choice pistachios are a great choice every time i eat a walnut i sneeze uh so there are some tannins in walnuts that certain people react to <laughs> so stay with stay with pistachios uh macadamia nuts i love macadamia yeah, nuts they're really good okay. um mac nuts are okay yeah, so, but yeah, so get yourself some peeled almonds. I'm gonna do that now. Try it. Okay, uh, you said American milk is something that we should not have in order to fix leaky gut. Yeah. Is there such thing as non-American milk that is okay to drink? Yeah, so most people can have sheep milk, can have goat milk. Interestingly enough, uh, goat milk uh, traditionally was called mother's milk because the, con the components in goat milk are very different than hmm. cow milk. Yeah. Uh, they're far more similar to human milk. Wow. And so I actually tell mothers if they're going to you know, give their child some animal milk, please make it goat milk Interesting. You know, rather okay. than cow's milk. Okay, and uh, is, is there any other foods the, that we yeah, should so, not eat to heal our uh, leaky gut? So the, the, more, the more you and I need to talk about this in Plant Paradox as well. But. Yeah. Uh, the more you, there are a few people that actually react to either the white or the yolk of eggs. Most mm -hmm. people don't. Okay. But the, we test for those. And here's just something to throw out. Yes. I don't want to cause widespread panic. Yes. There is a <laughs> lectin. There's enough of that in the world right now. That's right. Yeah, we got plenty. <laughs> there is a lectin in spinach mm. that... Um, I was unaware of, but thanks to a company called Vibrant America, they discovered that there are a class of lectins called aquaporins, and they're present in tobacco, they're present in spinach, they're present in corn, they're present in soybeans, they're present in uh, green peppers, and I wow. think that's it. Uh, anyhow, they actually can cause leaky gut, and they can cause leaky brain. Mm. And I stumbled upon this because I have a few people with really bad IBS and really bad autoimmune disease who are saints. They follow my program. They never cheat. Why would they? Why do they still have and, and they, issues? Yeah, why do they still have issues? And so when we had these new tests, lo and behold, almost every one of these people reacted to spinach. No way. And they ate a lot of spinach. Wow. 
And knock on wood so far, when we took the spinach away from them, uh, that was the key. Now, don't everybody go home and throw out your spinach. But if you're following my program and my program does have spinach in it and mm -hmm. we're still having problems, Take it out. consider giving up spinach. There's no human need for spinach. Now you said, uh, what was her name? Is she a Dr. Terry? Is that her name? Terry Walls, Dr. Terry Walls. You said she was doing like 10 or 12 cups of veggies a day for- yeah, Nine cups of vegetables. The, the snake uh, looking back at you. Yeah. Now what should those, now why is it important to have nine cups of vegetables and what does that do for your microbiome? So, your gut every day. This is so getting back to Dr. David Kessler, yes. head of the FDA. We thought that carbohydrates were carbohydrates and you know, and complex carbohydrates, uh, starches were fine because they're complex carbohydrates. Uh -huh. Everybody's wrong. You know, food manufacturers have figured out how to make a complex carbohydrate a simple carbohydrate and make you think it's a complex carbohydrate. Okay. So when you read a label. Number one, if you have to read a label, you're probably, you should put the package back because there shouldn't be a label on a head of lettuce. <laughs> right. I'll give you an example. But you have to take, and if anybody, if the take home point from this is, what we're, we're, we'll save so many people's lives. Mm. Read total carbohydrates on the label, then take away the dietary fiber. That'll be the next thing under it. So that will tell you the amount of grams of sugar per serving in that package. Do not look at where it says sugar. sugar. This is Do not look at added sugar. Mm. It is a lie. So it says zero sugar, zero added sugar. Yeah. So let me give you an example that he used on my podcast, which was a great example. He said, let me, what would you find in a store? The label says it's 300 calories. It has zero fat, it has zero grams of sugar, and it has four grams of protein, and it has 35 grams of carbohydrates. Is that broccoli? I don't know, what is that? It's a bagel. <laughs> a bagel? A bagel. And wow, 300 and calories? 300 calories. Wow. Zero sugar. How does that have zero sugar? I thought the that's just I it. it the, turns into sugar. the label law lies wow. to you. It's got thirty-five grams of carbohydrates. Now, to make that it makes sense, into sugar, right? which is sugar, it is pure sugar. In fact, it is better than sugar the way it has been manufactured. So wow. you take to figure out how much that is. There's four grams of sugar per teaspoon. So let's take his 35 grams of sugar, divide by four, let's make it easy, make it 36 grams. That's nine teaspoons of raw sugar in that bagel. In a bagel. So that's number one. All of a sudden you have- How many grams of sugar would that be? That's, well, so a, a Coke, a 12 ounce Coke is like about what? 12 grams of sugar. Wow. So you're basically chugging a Coke when you eat when a bagel. A bagel and it'll actually get into your bloodstream faster no. than if you chugged a Coke. No way. How is it going faster when it's just because liquid? Because it's been broken down. You actually have to digest the sugar molecule in the Coke. You don't have to digest the sugar molecule in a bagel. Really? Yeah, in main, main lines. So that's number one. Number two, what nobody knew was the bacteria that most of your bacteria live down in your colon and your lower part of your small intestine. And they're waiting for the complex carbohydrates that you do not digest normally. They're waiting for their meal that always used to come. And that meal never comes anymore because everything's been so finely processed that we don't get those complex carbohydrates yeah. down to them. So they starve to death. Mm. Now, what's really cool is that those guys take that meal and they make all these really cool compounds that number one, keep the wall of the gut intact, allow the wall of the gut to heal itself. 
They make compounds that actually are text messages to the mitochondria in all of our cells, and particularly in our brain, that guys down in the engine room are working under full power, and we've got, you know, Scotty beam me up sort of thing, you know, give me warp drive five, and we've got the power, and, you know, it's okay to go into hyperspace. If they don't make those compounds, your mitochondria go, geez, I'm not, I, I got nothing to work with here, and we got no backup system, mm. I'm gonna sputter down <clears throat> to a crawl. And people wonder why they're fatigued, even though right. they're eating more than ever, and they're eating all these sports drinks, and they're having you know, 12, 27 cups of coffee, and going, you know, where's my energy? Yeah. And it's because we no longer have this beautifully designed symbiotic re relationship, and we've starved mm. the most important part of, of us. And that's why Jack Lane said, if it tastes good, spit it out. <laughs> so, so why nine cups of vegetables then? Because that is actually giving those guys what they want to eat. Now, Terry doesn't, didn't know this back then, but her first book was Minding My Mitochondria or Feeding My Mitochondria. Mm -hmm. But now we know it's actually, we got to feed those guys. We have to eat for them. Mitochondria. We got to eat for the bacteria. They live in our gut. They're back. They're back. So not the mitochondria. Yeah. So in the longevity paradox, here's the really scary thing: mitochondria are actually engulfed <clears throat> ancient bacteria. <clears throat> wow. Long, billions of years ago, um, cells invited bacteria to live inside them. In exchange for a nice place to live, the cells said, we'll give you what you want to eat in exchange for you making ATP, energy, okay. for us. And obviously it was a good deal and because that's continued now. So within us, all of our cells have engulfed ancient bacteria that produce mm. energy for us. And what's so really fun is the bacteria in your gut are the sisters of the mitochondria, which are bacteria in our cells. Wow. And they actually talk to each other. Okay. And here's what's really cool. You and I inherited our mitochondria from our mother. Dad did not give us any mitochondria. Okay. So all mitochondria are female mm. and if everything went okay, you and I inherited our gut microbiome from our mother, who literally took a crap on us as we <laughs> exited the birth right, canal. Right. And you know, most everybody kind of knows that. You know, yeah. <laughs> mom took a crap on me. I, <laughs> yeah, uh, ladies, if you hate your mother, no, she didn't. She, she didn't take a crap on you. But your mother gives you your initial dose of bacteria. Mm. And that's actually why cesarean section babies who don't get that dose mm. take up to six months to get a normal immune system wow. compared to a vaginal delivery because they don't have the proper set of bacteria that educate the immune system. That's crazy. Yeah. Now, you're speaking about immune system. How can we boost and protect our immune system in time of pandemic, crisis, stress, and overwhelm? What are the things we can do right yeah. now? So the first thing you do is you absolutely positively stay away from simple carbohydrates. Wow. And I can tell you that if it's in a package, it is probably a simple carbohydrate. Even what would appear to be healthy. So. Um, Plantain chips. Um, no, yeah. I can't eat those. Come on. Read the label and it will scare you to death. Will I eat plantain chips? Sure I will, but I will use them as a dipping chip to get guacamole in my mm. mouth. Or olive oil. Or olive oil, yeah. So, <sighs> man, I know. So you stay away from simple carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. And what's really scary in times of pandemics mm -hmm. is the grocery store shelves are empty. <laughs> of bread and bagels and pasta ah, and tomato sauce that's good for and you. milk and ice cream and orange juice there's 
five to six teaspoons of, of sugar. sugar in a cup of orange juice. So it's actually good when the shelves are cleared of all the bad things. That's right. Believe it or not, right now, most of everything in the grocery store is actually good for you because it's all been cleared out of all the bad stuff. Mm -hmm. But what worries me is all that bad stuff is being consumed. Yeah. And the best way to suppress your immune system is sugar. Mm. Sugar absolutely suppresses white blood cell function. So, please don't eat like that. Okay. But luckily, the stores are, and, and the other thing I remind all my listeners is that we are the only creature that needs or uses toilet paper. <laughs> right. And if you follow my program, you won't need it. You will not <clears throat> need toilet paper. I, <laughs> I have many friends that say they don't need a wipe. Yeah. Maybe you take one little yeah. piece yeah, just, one to little piece, sure. just to make sure. Just insurance, yeah, but you never yeah, know. Yeah. And so, you know, I know when, you know, I've got some issue that, you know, that I need, need toilet more, paper. more than one piece <laughs> of toilet paper. Yeah. So if you're if you need toilet paper, I got news for you, you got a leaky gut. You're eating the wrong things. You're eating the wrong stuff. So no simple carbs. Essentially, if it's in a package, it's probably not good. No sugar. It suppresses the immune system. What else? Um, either so, hurts you know, the immune system and what boosts the immune system. Yeah, so what boosts the immune system? It turns out that um, olive oil, mm -hmm. the polyphenols in olive oil, actually really boost the immune system. So do components of mushrooms. And, you know, I... I make one and we'll get you some called M Vitality, which is a mushroom extract. But mushrooms in general, even the humble button mushroom, will actually boost your immune system. And it does that actually by having the sort of complex sugars that your gut bacteria really, really wants want. and needs. Exactly. And so it's more of an indirect effect. You give your gut bacteria what they want and need, they in turn will tell the immune system, hey, we got this, and mm -hmm. you know, relax and enjoy yourself. Wow. The other thing, every human being that I see initially with leaky gut or autoimmune <clears throat> disease has a low vitamin D level. Mm -hmm. uh, I had Mark Hyman on my podcast recently, and Mark has never seen vitamin D toxicity. Mm -hmm. I have been measuring vitamin D levels for over 20 years now. I have never seen vitamin D toxicity. Uh, I you can't have too much necessarily. I, yeah, I have yet to see it. Uh, right. Could it exist? I mean, if you have a whole bottle a day, maybe it's yeah. not good. Yeah, well, and actually Dr. Hollick from Boston University, who's really the world expert on vitamin D, has seen it only once. And that was in a physician who by accident was taking a million international units of vitamin D3 a day for six months. That's a lot. That's a lot. Now, what is that, a whole cup full that, a day or Well, something? he had been getting it from a compounding pharmacist okay. and it had been mislabeled. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't doing it on purpose. Um, but for instance, I, I, I run my vitamin D level greater than 120 nanograms per milliliter and I have for 18 years to prove I'm not dead. Right. So many of the labs now are coming around to saying 120 is absolutely normal and it's not vitamin D toxic. I have patients, uh, I may have told you this story, it's a great sure. story, years ago, I had two people in their late 70s, first time, and we get vitamin D levels. Back in those days, we could actually quant we'd quantify the vitamin D level and the vitamin D was 270, both of them. Uh, and you know, I'm looking at them and I was, young and naive, and I'm thinking, you know, why aren't these guys dead? And I said, you guys take a lot of vitamin D, don't you? And they said, oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an anti-aging uh, vitamin. And mm. I said, it actually is, but um, I said, well, how long have you been doing that? And they said, oh, all of our lives. And I'm going, you know, you look pretty healthy to me. <laughs> and in theory, vitamin D can give you kidney stone, mm. toxic vitamin D levels. Never seen it, but in theory. Uh, any kidney stones? No, why? Um, and the other theory is it makes your fingers and toes numb. Mm. And I said, uh, any you know, fingers, toes, numb? No, why? And I'm going, huh. Hey, you know, huh. So that's when I actually started researching vitamin D. And for instance, the University of California, San Diego says that the average American should take 9,600 international units a day to have a safe level of vitamin D. Hmm. 
The other thing that's fascinating is most people with cancer have low levels of vitamin D. And there's some very interesting trials of boosting vitamin D in people who have cancer mm. to prevent recurrences. So, um, right now, uh, I, I think everybody should be taking 5,000 international units, but right now... A day? A day. Uh, right now, we're probably wise to boost it to 10,000 a day. Wow. I'll give you an example. Uh, last week when this started, and I still see patients every day, um, I took 100,000 units on Monday, I took 50,000 <laughs> units on Tuesday, and I took 25,000 units on Wednesday, and then hit 10,000 units. If I feel I'm coming down with something, you take more I feet. will take 150,000 units three days in a row. 50,000 three times a day for three days. That's nearly a half a million international units of vitamin D in three days. Wow. And I'm not dead. Uh, I have my patients do the same thing. Uh, none of them have died. None of them have gotten vitamin D toxicity. But I can tell you, it always cuts whatever. It's one of the most effective antivirals there is. The second thing we need to do is we need to get, if you can, time to release vitamin C. Linus Pauling was right. Vitamin C is incredibly antiviral, but what he didn't know is we can't absorb enough vitamin C and keep it in our bloodstream because it comes out, it comes out very, very quickly. So get yourself some time release vitamin C. The stores are empty, Amazon's empty. Right. But in the future, bar <laughs> barring them in the future, barring that, go to it's still there. I go to health food stores every yeah, day and yeah, just yeah. kind of check and see what's there and what isn't. Get yourself just the chewable tablets yeah, or get good. the capsules and take it four times a day. Take mm -hmm. 500 to 1,000 four times a day. Yeah, it's still better than nothing. Right? It's still better than nothing. Uh, zinc is a great idea. Get about 30 milligrams of zinc. I'm a big fan of quercetin, sometimes pronounced quercetin. It's a compound that's present in the white pith of citrus. It's in apples and it's in onions. Mm -hmm. And it actually may be the compound that the old wives' tale and apple a day keeps the doctor away. Right. So quercetin is also very antiviral. Okay. And there's an exciting new paper that was just published yesterday that astaxanthin uh, seems to prevent the inflammatory response to the coronavirus. Hmm. Asta astaxanthin. It is a, a compound that actually makes salmon red, um, and salmon eat algae and plankton that have, that produce astaxanthin. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a really cool compound. Wow. Yeah. Do you think it's possible that we could defend and arm our bodies and our immune system could be so strong that if any virus like the coronavirus came in our mouth and was in us, that we could reject it and not attached to our bodies? Correct. That's the whole idea. Really? It's you, possible you, to do that? You are designed to... To defend it. Just to block them all. It. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And it's, we, like a, it's like a fullback running through, just blocking everyone so you can score. Yeah. It, you are designed to do that. I when mean, your immune system is strong, then you, you don't get sick. You don't get sick. And it doesn't matter how strong the virus is, you should be able to defend against it. It's when it's weak when you start to get sick. That's exactly right. Wow. And, you know, I mean, you have different parts of your immune system lined up on all your mucous membranes, mm -hmm. ready for, you know, what's coming. And what's unfortunate is, in a lot of our patients with leaky gut and with autoimmune diseases, we can actually measure that they're very deficient in the immune system that makes, for instance, IgA, which lines are the walls of our gut and IgM, which is the second line of defense. And we can see that when we get their gut sealed, that, wow, their immune system is back. All their numbers are back up to normal. But that's what's happening. So again, the reason mm -hmm. people with chronic diseases are susceptible to the virus is not because they have a chronic disease. 
it's because that is a sign a that leaky gut. of a leaky gut and your immune system is impaired. Fix the leaky gut, you won't Boom. get sick. You won't get sick. That's what, you know, people, <clears throat> my patients go, this is so weird, you know, I used to get a cold two times a year and now oh, I, I don't know. get cold and all my friends do. Thanks so much for watching, but don't go anywhere. This next one is sure to surprise you. Of the oldest living human beings who are living well, these are 105 year old plus. Those individuals had the most uncoupled mitochondria.